the colleagues. Are you happy with the video and the? Yeah. It's, 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 colleagues, dear friends, it's already uh, twelve uh, Geneva time. So, with your uh, permission, I will start the event. We might have to mute some of you because we hear some uh, background noises. So don't forget to uh, to unmute yourself, which is your case, Excellency. Yeah. Thank you very much. So don't forget to unmute yourself or open the video when you are taking the floor. Um, as I mentioned, it's 12 uh, Geneva time, so we are now launching this event. Two seconds, let me check. Yes, it's done. My colleagues are making me last minute reminders. Excellencies, dear colleagues, welcome to this new Bit Plastic Pollution Dialogue, co-organized with our friends of IPEN. Those of you who regularly join us already know that the third series of dialogues kicked off after the adoption two years ago of a historical resolution at the United Nations Environment Assembly, setting up the path to a global treaty to end plastic pollution. The Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee to develop this international legally binding instrument that was set up following the adoption of the resolution will meet for its fourth session, referred to as INC4, in April in Ottawa, Canada. Taking place during the intersessional period ahead of INC4, today's dialogue aims to provide guidance and increase clarity on why it is crucial to regulate chemicals and ensure that the plastics treated will ensure the protection of human health. We are delighted today to be joined by the chair of the INC, His Excellency Luis Vallas, uh, and by various uh, leading uh, experts who are, um, who, um, uh, uh, are highly engaged to have an ambitious treaty adopted at the end of this process. In preparation of INC4, we have already hosted five dialogues discussing key thematics and launching important documents to feed negotiators. We have indeed discussed global criteria to address problematic, unnecessary, and avoidable plastic products. We have this re discussed resource mobilization and financing uh, for system change and just transitions. We have discussed and launched the state of the science uh, on plastics chemicals, identifying and addressing chemicals and polymers of concern. We have also discussed climate impacts of plastics. And earlier this week, we have uh, uh, presented IUCN's proposal for a super um, specific article on biodiversity aspects in the future treaty. And there are at least six more dialogues in preparation ahead of INC4, discussing topics such as trade, human rights, health, and more. So uh, uh, let's uh, keep um, turned after this uh, event. Let me also remind our audience that the dia dialogues are organized by the Geneva Environment Network in collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, IUCN, Norway, Switzerland, and the Forum on Trade, Environment, and the SDGs, and the University of Geneva. Today's event will be moderated by Griffin Zoshiank, the Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Justice and Development and, and Co-Chair of IPEN Toxic Plastic Working Group. And before you are formally welcome, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary, as well as the video of the event will be made available as usual on the webpage of this event. The link is being shared on the screen. Throughout the event, those uh, who are, so uh, you can raise your questions by using the Q&A box. We have a dedicated session to answer this after the presentation, if time allows. I would also like to add that the interpretation is provided uh, to French and to Spanish. You can click on the interpretation or the little globe at the end uh, to access it. And there's a slide uh, now on your screen that is also providing uh, an explanation. And um, last point I would like to add is that we have transcript uh, also available in 100 languages as indicated in this new slide. So now moving to the opening session of this event, we are delighted to give the floor to Griffins Oshien, who is joining us from Mombasa in Kenya. Griffins, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Diana. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, and welcome to this briefing organized by IPEN and Geneva Environment Network. As mentioned, my name is Griffin Suchieng. I'm Executive Director of Center for Environment, Justice and Development. Uh, we are based in Nairobi, and also a member of IPEN. I co-chair the IPEN Toxics Plastic Working Group. So if I just start this third session, 
uh, of the INC finished with a broad agreement on having intersectional work on chemicals, even if an agreement could not be reached. Indeed, chemicals are a crucial part to realize the treaty objective to promote protect human health in the plastic treaty. Negotiations are getting to a crucial stage. Uh, and with this briefing, we would like to improve the understanding of the issues uh, relating to chemical risks as well as chemical regulation. Therefore, we have a great lineup of experts that will provide uh, insights and will answer some of the questions that participants may have during the Q&A session. First of all, I would like to give the floor uh, to Ambassador Luis Payas Valdivieso from Ecuador, I hope I pronounce well, who will take over the chair uh, of the INC for some welcoming remarks. Uh, Luis, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, Griffins, and very well pronounced, actually. Thank you very much, and good morning, uh, good afternoon to all of you. And thank you very much. I can see we have a large participation, which is quite quite important and quite good. Well, my gratitude also to the General Environmental Network for organizing this uh, series of events. I think it's quite important, the events you're organizing, and I thank you very much also for the one uh, today to talk also about the, the treaty uh, that we are negotiating. Also, my gratitude to, to Uruguay and Switzerland, BRS Secretariat, and of course, IPEN and University of, of Texas. And thank you very much also to Diana for, for hosting us uh, today. Um, well, as you know, we are in our uh, few days to our fourth round of negotiations that will take place in, in Ottawa, in Canada, uh, now in April. And it has been, uh, for me, really good and important to see all the work we have done intersessionally. We didn't get, as you know, a formal mandate from INC3 to have a intersessional, a formal intersessional work, but even though I have seen a wonderful uh, intersessional work done by countries, by member states, I have, I have attended all regional consultations uh, in person, and I have seen how regional regions are working within the regions and also together with other uh, regions, with other countries uh, working and working hard. Uh, from my side as a chair, together with my team and the secretariat, we have organized a series of um, a heads of delegation meeting, of course, inform informal virtual meetings with, with the heads of delegations. They have been quite productive, quite interesting, and very important also to exchange views uh, different views from different countries and, and also from different regions and group of countries. And it has been quite important also to prepare this way our path to INC for. At the same time, I, I have seen great work also intersectionally from uh, civil society representatives, from uh, NGOs, from private sector, uh, from different organizations, from the scientific community, which has always uh, is very welcome. And, and I can see that also working hard and shows, it gives the, the message that uh, civil society organizations are quite engaged also in this process. Just to tell you in numbers, we will be almost 4,000 participants in, in Ottawa, in INC4, and 75% or almost 75% of the participants are from observers. So it's a large number, which is quite good. It, it shows the engagement uh, in the, within the process, but also is a challenge. We need uh, to organize our events. We need to organize also the contribution because it's not only participation, it's also contribution uh, of, of all uh, stakeholders and all actors in this, in this process. It is quite important, and I want to underline for me this, it's quite important that after INC4, we get a, a mandate or a formal a mandate for formal intersectional work. That will be very important, thinking that it will be our last intersectional period between INC4 and INC5. And in INC5, <clears throat> sorry, we need to agree in our text of our future uh, treaty. Another thing that is quite important is that, uh, and I have mentioned this to the, to the member states, 
that we get a good structure of work, that we get a good, good working plan in INC4, that we give the possibilities to optimize our time because time is limited uh, and we need to optimize and make effective negotiations in INC4. So I'm preparing the, the a scenario note that it will be released next week with the structure of work that I would like to see in INC4. We will maintain the two contact groups, contact group one and two, and these contact groups will be uh, subdivided in subgroups uh, with specific topics each one. Uh, we are proposing, I'm proposing to have uh, three subgroups in contact group one and two subgroups in contact group two with specific topics uh, to focus in our negotiation. Uh, also, uh, what is important, and I think it, it, it is needed uh, to, to consider and hopefully to establish in INC4 is a legal drafting group. Uh, so in my scenario note, you will find also uh, the uh, consideration that I would like to see in INC4 for establishing a legal drafting group. Um, it could start working too if the member states decide so. It could start working the, the legal drafting group during INC4. What is important, again, you know, is to give a good space of negotiation. We do not have too much, too many hours of negotiation. If you, you add INC4 plus INC5, we will get to 85 hours of negotiation. So we need to optimize our time. Um, again, you know, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm very happy to share with you uh, any uh, uh, other uh, questions or comments that you would like to present to me, but to tell you also that for me, it's quite important also that this process and negotiations in Ottawa and the whole process uh, all the way to Busan, it's that it's important that it's an inclusive, transparent, constructive uh, uh, environment that we give to this negotiation. We need a good environment to work in this, in this process. Thank you very much again, uh, and happy to be here and happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, and uh, for your word, and we look forward to your guidance in the finalization of, of the process. The next speaker is Valentina Sierra uh, from the Permanent Mission of Uruguay to the UN in Geneva, who has been working for many years on chemical and waste-related uh, multilateral environment agreements. Valentina will highlight some of the questions uh, delegates may have to navigate to ensure that an appropriate coverage of chemicals in the treaty, as well as the needs from countries that have limited production of chemical or plastics and chemicals. Valentina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Greetings and thanks to IPEN and to the Geneva Environment Network for organizing this webinar. Also, many thanks, Mr. Chair, uh, for your hard work. I'm sure that your leadership will lead us to achieve successful results. UNEA Resolution 5-14 gave us a mandate to start a negotiation for a treaty on plastics based on a comprehensive approach that would address the full life cycle of plastics and that would promote their sustainable production and consumption. As plastics are made of chemicals, inevitably the treaty will need to control their composition and the pollution from plastics throughout the life cycle. In particular, a non-toxic circular economy begins with the design of products that reduces material input, that avoids the use of toxic chemicals and enables reuse and recycling. If plastics that contain toxic additives are recycled, uh, recycled we will create a new hazardous products posing new and additional risks and long-term adverse effects on human health and also on the environment. For us, the Plastic Treaty must include obligations for redu reducing the, produ the production of primary plastic polymers and for effectively phasing out or severely restricting the production and or the use of specific polymers, chemicals and plastic products that are harmful to the environment and human health that are also problematic because they impede circularity or that they have a high risk of release into the environment. At the same time, it must be secured that a potential replacement of polymers 
uh, chemicals and plastic products by other alternatives and substitutes will not lead to any comparable kind of human health of harm to the human health and the environment and that they will be affordable and accessible, especially to developing countries. I know these are ambitious objectives and, and we learned that the plastic contains thousands of chemicals and that many of them are of potential concern. So we really need to have practical ways to regulate them, regulating them. Additionally, as plastic are treated around the world as materials in products and as waste, understanding what is the chemical composition of these plastics is challenging, but it's also necessary to protect our health. I look forward to hearing inputs for various experts that we have here among us today so that we turn this expertise in workable provisions for this treaty. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Valentina. These, uh, these are concerns that are also shared by, by many in the, in the negotiation, particularly in Africa, which is not a major producer of the chemicals and the plastics of concern, is to ensure that we don't import products that are difficult to manage at the end of their life and also cause health and environmental harm. So we now give the word to science. Uh, Professor Andrea Gore is the co-author of a recent report for IPEN on endocrine disrupting chemicals in plastic, and will present to us the latest science on these chemicals that are widely present in plastics. Uh, Professor Gore, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, if we could get the next slide. Uh, thank you. So just in February, the Endocrine Society and IPEN worked together to produce this guide to endocrine disrupting chemicals, threats to human health. And I'm here today to talk about these threats that we have from plastics. Next slide. Although, as I just heard, there are thousands of chemicals in plastics, many of those chemicals are what we call endocrine disrupting chemicals. And endocrine disrupting chemicals are probably the biggest health threat from uh, plastics. I'm going to call them EDCs. EDCs act by interfering with hormones and their actions. We need hormones to properly function in order for us to grow, develop, undergo metabolism, str manage stress, reproduce, and many other functions. When these functions are perturbed by endocrine disrupting chemicals, that is associated with a whole range of health effects in humans including diabetes, obesity and cardiovascular disease, reproductive problems, behavioral problems, and certain cancers. Next slide. What has become clear, both from the latest Endocrine Society IPEN guide, as well as several scientific statements from the Endocrine Society, which is the world's leading society in the study and the science and the practice of endocrinology. We, there is consensus that the, not only has the science on EDCs grow, but we have a much better understanding of how important these and other environmental factors are in disease prevalence. The reason we have this confidence is because there is an extremely strong convergence of evidence that comes from three different levels. First, from studies in the lab using cell lines that look at effects of chemicals uh, on different hormone pathways. Second, from animal models where we can do work to prove cause and effect between exposures and the developing development of one of these diseases I've talked about, um, and then from human epidemiology population studies that link uh, how much uh, body burden or how much body tissue content of these chemicals relates to in And among the endocrine disrupting chemicals, plastics and plasticizers such as bisphenols and phthalates probably have the strongest evidence as acting as EDCs and causing these effects. And this has been um, uh, 
agreed upon by many international scientific and medical organizations, not just the endocrine society, but also um, international health organizations, and they've called for stronger regulations. Next slide. This is the reason why I personally am so concerned about plastics and why I think it is so essential to be able to regulate plastics. And that is because plastics not only threaten all people and wildlife, but they are particularly problematic during certain key points of life, in particular um, to the mother and to the baby during pregnancy and to the child. Uh, during postnatal development, during puberty, all times when hormones are changing and when the when the sensitivity of the body to hormones um, is at its highest. In the world of endocrinology, we like to use the phrase, the timing makes the poison, and that differentiates us from other kinds of toxicological studies, which talk about the dose makes the poison, meaning that Higher doses are worse than lower doses. In endocrinology, we say the timing makes the poison because we know that it's not just how much, but when the exposures are happening that probably have the greatest effects and that even extraordinarily low exposure, low level exposures can have biological effects. We also know that EDC effects can have impacts on multiple generations through their effects on the cells that become sperm and egg cells and then can transmit these effects of exposure. Next slide. So, uh, although the IPEN Endocrine Society Guide talked about many different chemicals, uh, we're here to talk about plastics and plasticizers, and uh, in particular, bisphenols and phthalates that are best studied for human health effects. Next slide. Okay, so first bisphenols. So usually when we talk about bisphenols, at least as scientists in my world, we talk about bisphenol A, but we also have to talk about the chemicals that have substituted for BPA, most of which are uh, in the bisphenol family, um, just very briefly. People are exposed through many routes, including uh, leaching from reusable food and beverage containers, can linings, medical and sports equipment, eyeglass lenses, uh, thermal paper receipts, plastic water pipes, and adhesives, paints, and lacquers, amongst uh, other exposures. Next slide. And phthalates, again, we are quite ubiquitous ubiquitously exposed to phthalates through contact with um, PVC, personal care products, fillers and medications and supplements, uh, also in food and beverage packaging and processing materials, children's toys and medical tubing. Next slide. So, Bisphenols and phthalates, although not as persistent as what we call the persistent organic chemicals, the exposure to these chemicals is so ubiquitous internationally that, ev that even if they don't last in the body very long, we are constantly being re-exposed to these chemicals. And of course, as I mentioned, when we talk about quote unquote BPA-free products, this also can include these replacements, such as BPS, BPF, BPAF, which are also EDCs. Um, and similarly, phthalate replacements can be part of this regrettable substitution cycle where, where one similar chemical is replaced for another, which really doesn't take away uh, the, the adverse health effects of, the, of these chemicals. You're just replacing them. Um, we also know a lot about the mechanisms of action, and uh, BPA is best studied for its effects on the estrogen receptor and phthalates for their effects on androgen receptor. So these are receptors for sex hormones. Um, but these are this is really the tip of the iceberg on how these chemicals can act as EDCs. They can also affect 
hormone metabolism. They can affect how sor hormones circulate through the body. They can affect actions of hormones um, in other ways other than their receptor. So, so these chemicals can uh, perturb the endocrine system in many biological ways. Next slide. And here's really what is the key point of my short presentation. And those are the negative health outcomes that are linked to phthalates and bisphenols. And I just have brief time to give you some general, give you a general list. Um, but uh, this includes brain development and behavior. The brain is very sensitive to hormones. The brain even makes hormones. And so there are links between these plastics chemicals with anxiety, depression, ADHD, um, metabolic problems such as diabetes and obesity, reproductive problems almost across the board. Every reproductive disease has been connected to exposures to these chemicals related to things like problems with fertility, polycystic ovarian syndrome, sexual dysfunction, uh, disruptions in testosterone and estrogen levels and so on. Uh, the endocrine system has a number of organs that are also susceptible to developing cancers, and EDCs are associated with the hormone-sensitive cancers such as breast, prostate, ovarian, and endometrial. Uh, they interfere with thyroid hormone action, and there's strong evidence now that they're associated with cardiovascular disease and hypertension. Next slide. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you again for having me, and I would be happy to take questions in the chat or during the Q&A at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gore. And as you just mentioned, there are already some questions streaming in to the Q&A chat. So I think I encourage all the panelists, they may be able to look at the questions and just begin think around how to respond to that. We have a question and answer session coming up later on. But next uh, is Dr. Therese Carlson, IPEN Science Advisor. She will present some answers to some of the frequently asked questions or common misconceptions that have been collected during the treaty negotiations. Uh, Therese, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Griffins, and thank you to my fellow co-organizers and fellow speakers. And especially big thank you to Geneva Environment Network for helping to provide so much information throughout these negotiations. It's truly invaluable. And I also want to thank all of you that are joining here today. And I will continue talking about chemicals and plastics. More specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the questions that we have realized are quite frequently asked or frequently reoccurring throughout these negotiations. And one of those first questions is, let me see that I can change here. Uh, do we need to manage production to protect human health and the environment? And the simple answer is yes. Because this is where we're at now. The reason that we are having these negotiations, the reason that we're having these talks is because there has been a global realization that the way that we are producing plastics today is unsustainable. It is, it has surpassed planetary boundaries and it is causing harm throughout the life cycle to both the environment and to human health. And the plastics treaty provides and um, an opportunity to protect human health and the environment. And doing so will require eliminating toxic chemicals and controlling plastic production volumes. And sometimes when we talk about this, people bring up plastics recycling as part of the solution. But what we're seeing in our studies and as well in other scientific studies is that recycled plastics come with a large amount of toxic chemicals. Because when you recycle plastics, you combine different materials that have different unknown chemicals in them into a new material that has an even more complex mix of chemicals. So study after study is showing that recycled plastics are more toxic than virgin plastics. 
which means that it's not really a suitable solution if we want to safer and more sustainable plastics in the future. Instead, the controls need to happen earlier in the life cycle. And in order to do that, we need to understand how what, what plastics are. What are they made of? What are the parts in plastics? And if we look at it in a very simplified way, we can say that plastics are a combination of carbon and chemicals. Most of both the carbon and the chemicals comes from fossil fuels, but even if they're bio-based, they come with very similar concerns. If we look a little bit more at the details, we can see that plastic consists of different types of chemicals. Um, there's monomers. Mono means one. So that's one unit of a molecule. One example could be styrene, ethylene, vinyl chloride. These are then combined to create polymers. Polymers means many. Poly means many. So you would have polyethylene, many ethylenes, polystyrene, many styrenes. And this creates sort of the backbone of plastics. To this, a set of additives are added to create specific properties in the materials. This can be flame retardants, colors, it can be UV stabilizers, and a lot of other different types of chemicals. And aside from these three intentionally added chemicals, monomers, polymers, and additives, there's also what's known as non-intentionally added substances, or NEAS. And examples of this can be degradation products. So there can be chemicals that during, during the material's life degrades to other chemicals, or it can be chemicals that come from recycled plastics. Because again, when we recycle plastics, the chemicals that were in the original products comes into the new products with very little control or transparency or even knowledge on what's in there. And this is really what makes plastics a set of different types of chemicals. So on the question of why should a global plastics treaty address toxic chemicals, the answer really is because plastics are chemicals. And many of these chemicals are toxic. Many are not internationally regulated. In fact, only a very, very small portion are internationally regulated throughout their life cycle. But they still spread internationally in plastic materials and harm human health and the environment. So if we look a little bit at which chemicals that should be included in a first list of chemicals that could be regulated under the treaty. Andrea already mentioned two examples of bisphenols and phthalates. And these are chemicals that are known to be toxic, they're known to be used in plastics, and they increase barriers to circularity because they are toxic. And I also wanted to mention polystyrene here as an example of a polymer that could be part of an initial list to be regulated under the treaty. Because I want to highlight that polymers are chemicals and some polymers are toxic in and of themselves. Some polymers can leach monomers, so these units that the polymer is made from. Uh, that are toxic. One example here is styrene, which is a known carcinogen, a known endocrine disruptant that can lead from polystyrene. And some polymers can lead to the formation of toxic byproducts. For example, when PVC is burnt, it leads to the formation of dioxins. And I, I want to emphasize here that it's important that for chemicals of concern, it is important to take a hazard-based approach because for many of these chemicals, the, the toxicity of the chemical is really enough to warrant a protective regulation. The opposite approach would be a risk-based approach, and this is an outdated approach that really doesn't take everything into concern. It, it disregards things such as endocrine disruption, and it would also require long, costly evaluations, and it is not possible 
to envision all of the different exposure pathways throughout the life cycle of plastics. So a hazard-based approach is really the only feasible way to regulate chemicals in plastics. And looking at the revised zero draft, um, it, it can be a little bit confusing when we talk about polymers, because what I'm talking about here is different from provision one that talks about primary plastic polymers, because that's more on production volumes, which is also very important. It's also different from plastic products, which is more on which type of products are avoidable or unnecessary. What I'm talking about here is really which polymers have intrinsic properties that make them toxic and should therefore be regulated as chemicals of concern under its own provision. And I want to end by just emphasizing that plastics are chemicals, many of which are toxic. So protecting human health and the environment will require measures to control production volumes. It will require the elimination of toxic chemicals. And it will require provisions that ensure transparency and traceability across the full life cycle of plastics so that we can have a safer and more sustainable use of plastics in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Therese, uh, for that. Uh, next is Kay, as we move, move uh, forward swift, swiftly. I also see there are a number of questions that are coming up on the q and I encourage you all the panelists to or speakers to just look into that. Uh, next is Kay, Dr. Kay Ono from the BRS Secretariat, who, is, who was probably more experienced than anyone in the regulation of chemicals on plastics, in plastics internationally. Given that many of the chemicals regulated under the Stockholm Convention are also used in plastics. Uh, Kay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation today. Thanks to the organizers and many thanks to the participants. Let me try, click to gain control of my slides. So I will talk about um, how the existing mechanisms are addressing chemicals and what are gaps. So earlier last year, the BRS published this uh, Global Governance of Plastics and Associated Chemicals publications, in which you can find out the, how the chemicals in plastics are addressed in the, the existing mechanisms and what are the synergies and opportunities there. UNEP also developed a, um, a comprehensive report called Chemicals in Plastics, and this is available also online for your access. Try next. Right. So in this um, pink publication, we have um, outlined many of those multilateral instruments that are currently addressing chemicals in plastics, in uh, in in the specific um, under the specific control measures of these instruments. The first one on the Basel Convention, which relates to waste management, as you may be aware, in 2019 the amend, uh, annexes were amended to clarify the scope of plastic waste covered under the convention. And there you can see types of polymers, resins, and hazardous constituents that needs to be um, uh, controlled for transboundary movement and also applied environmentally sound management practice as per the Basel Convention. The second convention is the Rotterdam Convention on Prior Informed Consent Procedure. This pro provides a mechanism to exchange information in uh, when trading hazardous chemicals that are listed in Annex 3 to the convention. Currently, there are 55 chemicals listed, and many of them are pesticides, but some are industrial chemicals. And in fact, 15 of them are associated with plastics. The mechanism to add new chemicals in Annex 3 is triggered by notifications of final regulatory action, which means that the um, either prohibition or severe restriction of chemical in at least two countries in different regions, different peak regions, then it will initiate the process of review by the subsidiary body chemical review committee. The third one is the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. I will discuss a bit more detail in my next slides. 
Then the Minamata Convention on Mercury, this lists mercury, um, including mercury added products in Annex A and the processes in Annex B um, to minimize their use and emissions. These annexes can be amended and the process is proposed, um, is triggered by a proposal um, submitted by a party. The convention does not have um, any specific or standing committee like Rotterdam or Stockholm, but on an ad hoc basis, the conference of parties may establish an expert group to further consider proposal if necessary. Another important MEA is Montreal Protocol that lists the ozone depleting substances and also substances with high global warming potential. The convention has, uh, the Montreal Protocol has a mechanism um, that allows assessment and review through panels. The, the amendments to annexes can be uh, triggered by a proposal uh, submitted by a party. Another very important MEA is the ILO Chemicals Convention that provides a classification of chemicals by hazards for the protection of workers. So there, the occupational um, aspects is addressed by this convention. Now, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. Um, those POPs are described in the, uh, within the convention text with the four main criteria, persistence, bioaccumulation, adverse effects, and potential for long-range environmental transport. Um, adverse effects in, um, indeed includes um, endocrine disrupt disrupting chemicals, as was detailed um, by Dr. Gore earlier. Now, the implication of listing chemicals in annexes is very important part of consideration. And so I have uh, outlined in this slide. Annex A lists chemicals for elimination, which means that um, parties to the convention needs to prohibit or take legal and administrative measures to eliminate production, use, import, export of these chemicals, except for those specific, uh, certain applications that are allowed as specific exemptions upon registration. But this is a time limited specific exemptions. Another important aspect is waste, waste management. So the waste um, products or articles containing POPs or these chemicals needs to be managed in an environmentally sound manner in line with the Basel Convention. So the Basel Convention provides what it means by environmentally sound management. And therefore, in the convention text, there is a specific and clear relationship um, provided. Then in Annex B, the chemicals are listed with acceptable purposes. That means that the parties can continue to produce or use these chemicals because of the lack of alternatives or the necessity to continue the use. And then the last annex is um, unintentional releases. So there was uh, also mentioning um, by Therese about um, production of dioxins and furans from open burning of or, or um, from PVCs uh, mismanagement. But in general, any waste being um, burnt, it could release dioxins and furans. And this is uh, addressed under Annex C through promotion of BATPEP or release limit values or performance standards. Another important aspect of the Stockholm Convention is the mechanism to review and add new chemicals. So under Article 8, there is the provision and uh, Stockholm Convention's subsidiary body that looks at the chemicals for listing. So the convention started with 12 dirty dozens, um, but it has added over the last years to a total of 22 new chemicals. So currently we have 34 persistent organic pollutants covered, of which 17 are plastic related chemicals. As you can see, fluorinated chemicals, chlorinated chemicals, or brominated chemicals, including water repellents, oil repellents, fl um, flame retardants, or UV absorbent, those are uh, some of the very toxic chemicals in plastics that are covered under the Stockholm Convention, including for the prohibition of production, use, import, export, and so on. And then, um, as I also already mentioned, there are toxic chemicals that are released unintentionally 
through mismanagement of plastic waste like dioxins and furans. Those are covered under Annex C. And currently, two more chemicals are under review, long chain PFCAs, another set of PFAS, and chlorinated paraffins that are with a medium chain. Now, this slide outlines a process for listing a new chemical. The process is triggered by a proposal submitted by a party. And then there's a screening criteria in Annex D. The third step is the most important part, whereby the POPs review committee determines whether the chemical is likely as a result of its long range environmental transport to lead to significant adverse human health under environmental effects, such that global action is warranted. Once this is determined, then the committee undertakes socioeconomic consideration and, and make a recommendation, including on the necessity for, for phase out period like specific exemptions. Then the last stage is a political decision taken by the conference, the parties to list these chemicals. It takes about four years in total to go through this process. The Annex D screening criteria includes those four main properties that I have mentioned earlier. Very important text included in the convention relates to Annex D stage is that the committee shall examine the proposal in a flexible and transparent way and also take into account all information in an integrative and balanced manner. And then at the Annex E stage, I'm trying to move this. Okay. Um, at the risk profile, the committee will further look into the chemical um, uh, environmental fate as well as exposure in local areas to determine whether it's a POP. Lack of full scientific certainty shall not prevent the proposal for proceeding from proceeding. So this is a very also another important text included in Article 8 of the Convention. And finally, at the listing stage, the COP, taking into account of the recommendations of the COPROC, including any scientific uncertainty, shall decide in a precautionary manner whether to list the chemical and specify related control measures. So with this uh, process, uh, one of the recently, most recently added plastic additive is UB328, and it has been looked at how the plastic debris can be uh, transported across the, the ocean and to the remote areas and affecting um, uh, human health and environment through this exposure to UB328. I would like to highlight the, the complexity in addressing industrial chemicals, industrial POPs, mm -hmm. as they are used in numerous processes and parts, complex supply chain, and involves many producers and users. And therefore, as uh, Therese mentioned, that it is important really to tra ensure transparency, transparency and traceability of chemicals in products throughout the life cycle. And it, it is equally challenging for persistent organic pollutants already listed under the Stockholm Convention. These are some of the photographs of the uh, chemicals like UV328 and Decloran Plus uh, used. Now, two more slides to outline some of the important elements that uh, experiences gained through the Stockholm Convention. One is the group, appro group approach in listing. Um, earlier, um, alpha hexachlorocyclohexane, beta hexachlorocyclohexane, and linden, which is gamma isomer of hexachlorocyclohexane, those were listed separately as part of the nine chemicals that were added in 2009. But later, for example, hexabromocyclododecan or decloran plus, all of those related isomers are covered by, by listing. And, and th this, this will ensure a um, more practical way of managing those chemicals. Regarding PFAS, for example, PFOS it's source and PFOS F, by listing PFOS F, which is the mother compound of PFOS, it means that the Stockholm Convention covers all 96 PFOS precursors. PFOA, its salts and PFOA related compounds are listed in Annex A. And PFOA related compounds means that all substances that degrade to PFOA, which includes more than 350 substances. Similarly, PFHXS related compounds have nearly 200 substances. Another important example is brominated diphenyl ethers. You can see in Annex A to the convention, 
tetra BD and penta BD. And then another one says hexa BD and hepta BDE. You might be wondering why only those two BDEs, but it's there are actually representative congeners present in commercial mixture. This will in, um, help the, the regulators to identify commercial mixture of penta BD and commercial mixture of octa BDE, respectively. And then, in addition, the convention lists decabromodifene ether commercial mixture, which means that technically almost all major PBDEs used as flame retardants are covered by the Stockholm Convention. And uh, other congener approaches like PCBs and chlorinated naphthalins can also be mentioned here. So, you, as, as mentioned, there are 34 chemicals listed in the Stockholm Convention, but actually, if you count all of them, it could nearly easily reach around 1000. My last slide um, uh, highlights chemicals of concern not covered by the Stockholm Convention. There are many other chemicals with adverse effects to human health and our environment that are not regulated by the Stockholm Convention or any other MEAs. They may be currently under review or there's not enough information to determine or no parties have submitted proposal or do not meet the criteria for listing, which means that they are out of scope. So some of the examples of those chemicals are phthalates, really mentioned by earlier speakers, bisphenols, they are also not listed under the convention, alkyl phenols, including nonyl phenol, octyl phenol, and PAHs, including benzoapyrin, although this chemical might meet the criteria for, uh, for uh, persistent organic pollutants, no party has uh, submitted proposals so far. And for PFAS, there are now only three entries listed. Finally, metals and metal compounds, those are inorganic chemicals and they are out of scope under the Stockholm Convention. Now, thank you very much. I think this was my last slide and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Kay, for that. And just as we move forward, I think moving well, I just want to acknowledge that uh, I've been informed that uh, Ambassador Ch uh, Louise, Chair of INC, will be leaving at uh, top of the hour. So maybe if you have some chance to just have some remarks before you leave, uh, we just remain with two more speakers. So I hope, wish you to still remain uh, on the webinar, uh, but uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Griffin. And I'm really sorry to, to have to leave because we have another meeting in a few minutes and it's related to the, actually to the, to the INC. And um, well, uh, I wanted to thank you and I'm so interested. I'm, I'm really listening and, and hearing very important information. And it is quite important for member states also to get this information. And uh, it's, it is you know, a process that we need, the scientific community, we need the scientists telling us also uh, the scientific evidence and data. It is important also that this data and the information that we receive as member countries is in a manner that we will be able to, to understand and realize how important uh, this treaty is to, to protect human health and the environment. One important aspect, and I, I, I would like to ask also uh, the Geneva, Geneva Environmental Network uh, to maybe prepare later on also a series uh, of these events on implementation, implementation of the treaty, because yes, we are looking for a robust treaty, an effective treaty, but also an, a, a treaty that will be uh, able to be implemented in our uh, countries. So implementation is quite important. And also for that implementation, it's very important the contribution of, of stakeholders, of scientific community uh, in the process of implementation. Thank you very much once again. A pleasure to be here, and I really apologize for uh, having to leave uh, at this moment. Thank you very much. We thank you so much uh, for taking time. Thank you. Uh, now we move. I uh, just want to invite uh, now Michelle Shiren uh, from the Swiss Federal Office for the Environment, who will update us on some of the informal intersectional work that has been led by Switzerland to advance the discussion on both uh, problematic products and on chemicals of concern. Great to see you, Michelle, and uh, welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much, Griffins, and uh, many thanks to the Geneva Environment Network and IPEN for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you today and speak about 
the um, intercessional work that was informal but still ongoing on the important topic that we are discussing today, the problematic and avoidable plastic products and the chemicals of concern. Next. So I'm happy to uh, use my time today to inform you about the, the concept that was being discussed in, informally by um, many active uh, engaged um, stakeholders and experts. But first, a word about the context for that wor work. So as you know, at the INC3, many uh, member states identified um, the substantial um, discussions that need to take place on plastic products and chemicals of concern. It was also a topic much addressed through written submissions, even uh, earlier in the INC process. Um, as mentioned by the chair, it was unfortunately not possible to agree formally on um, intercessional work. But we thought it was very important that for these topics, um, there can be expert discussions, even if that is to take place in an informal setting. It's also, of course, important, as we have just heard now from Kay, to take into account the existing multilateral environmental agreements uh, and see how um, these existing agreements can mutually support uh, themselves and not duplicate each other. It's important to consider that we are discussing a topic that is very dynamic. It, it, additional information will be uh, coming up as we go along. And the um, informal intercessional work that Switzerland has um, tried to enable and push is also to be seen, of course, in the, the overall mandate that we have from the Union Resolution 5-14 that tells us um, to address uh, plastic pollution by looking at the full life cycle and promoting circularity. Next. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what happened is that um, our objective was to uh, um, enable a discussion to, on how to best address problematic and avoidable plastic products and chemicals of concern in the future legally binding instrument. In order to facilitate the discussion, we have invited um, member states experts to a workshop uh, informally in Geneva. The invitation went through the INC focal point, so everyone was informed and had the possibility to uh, react to that information. We have also sent an input paper the, where the discussion would be uh, based on. The input, input paper did include draft uh, articles, uh, possible draft articles for the draft treaty, and also an initial product list and a placeholder for an initial chemicals list. Um, this paper is not the official position of Switzerland, and does not prejudge the ongoing negotiations. Again, it was to uh, have a basis for uh, expert discussions. And we were very happy that um, expert, experts joined us from around the world. There were from all UN regions uh, experts joining uh, in this discussion. Um, these experts will be going, most of them, to INC4. And therefore, the discussion was very useful. Next. So the concept that was uh, discussed at the workshop very briefly, it has three main uh, components, if you will. One is uh, about uh, problematic and avoidable products. One is about chemicals uh, of concern in these products. And the third is about uh, the required information that, we, uh, that is needed for uh, plastic products uh, on the market. The first part um, is described in concept as um, avoidable and problematic plastic products that should not be 
uh, on the market. So the scope is manufacturer, import and export. Um, these um, products would be on an initial list to be um, ready for INC5. And um, these are based on a few uh, generic uh, criteria. And the second part, the second component are, is the, the chemicals part, where again, it is about manufacture, import and export. Um, for for the, this part, the criteria uh, in, as captured in, a, in the concept would still need to be um, um, further uh, developed, recognizing the, compl the complexity of the issue. An initial list of these chemicals could be um, developed between the diplomatic conference and the first conference of the parties. Um, but of course, if a list can be developed, an initial list developed and considered earlier, then that would be uh, very welcome. The, the um, third part is about information um, that is needed with regard to um, plastic products. And it again has the same scope. Um, it would need to be further specified what kind of information exactly needs, needs to be there and, um, and what are the criteria to come up with that uh, third list. So it means that for all the three components, there would be um, ideally provisions, according to this concept, provisions in the draft treaty and the, and the, and the list. And that is what was um, discussed at the workshop. Next slide. The rationale for this concept was that uh, it is a complex area and a very important area. It is important, therefore, to build on ongoing uh, activities and um, on ongoing um, efforts um, to tackle these uh, challenges. With ongoing efforts, we mean uh, existing initiatives and practices in, on the business side and, and also existing regulation from um, the, the member states side. The approach um, recognized that negotiation time is very limited and that we need um, therefore also um, not just a, a good way, an ambitious way to tackle these issues, but think very much about how can we achieve it in a limited time and how can, um, can the work be sequenced because Considering that available time, and the chair has mentioned the figure of um, uh, 85 um, uh, hours remaining uh, negotiation time, then um, there need to be some uh, priorities uh, in order to take advantage of what we can do now and what can be further developed between and worked on between the diplomatic conference and the first conference of the parties. Next slide. It's also uh, important to recognize that the global lists will make the treaty effective as opposed to um, having, you know, a just criteria and uh, leaving up it to the national implementation as to what is really regulated, which would create a very fragmented uh, picture, make it very difficult um, to have the effect the treaty should have and to reach the objective with the treaty, therefore, that we want to reach. Um, these globalists will be a crucial part and they should also help to shift, to create a shift in investments that is uh, needed. Um, the concept recognizes that, um, again, as we go along over the years, the treaty needs to remain um, uh, meaningful, uh, and so there needs to be a mechanism to to update the treaty uh, and the lists in particular of of uh, products and chemicals and information needed. 
And it also, uh, the rationale for the concept is that for, for the implementation of global lists, not it will not be the same situation for all the member states. So this needs to be also taken into account. Next. The, what is the rationale for the listing of the product? So the, the concept um, addresses plastic uh, products that warrant elimination because of their uh, chemical composition or their adverse impact on recycling um, or their um, probability to end up in the environment. So is this type of uh, criteria that will um, have the effect of the a product being on, on that list. The list, uh, again, meaning that uh, the product by a certain uh, date will have to be phased out. Um, and again, it is the idea that um, it's very important to have an uh, existing initial list to, to put in um, the draft um, treaty because they're clearly with uh, the considering the ongoing initiatives and regulations uh, many countries actually have already uh, tackled some of the these problematic products and if considering those then certainly um, from the start the treaty will be able to have uh, quick gains and have a, an important effect and then further work will need to be done to further complement these initial uh, lists. What is in the concept is drawn from um, the criteria by the Global Plastic Pact Network, a public-private initiative that brings together um, 55 uh, governments and, and many businesses so as you can see, uh, again, considering a lot that is already uh, going on and is considering also existing uh, regulations. Uh, it was also the criteria of uh, in intentionally added microplastics was also added as this is um, an important element to be considered. Next slide. So, those were the main elements that um, were part of the, the concept that was discussed by the, the experts. It was um, so again important to recognize that we already have spent a lot of the time of the INC as also pointed out today by, by several and that the time um, is limited um, before we go to the diplomatic conference. Um, however, um, if you think about the, the time between the diplomatic conference and then the first conference of the parties, it, this is an important uh, time of, of uh, about three years where also important work um, can take place to complement what we will have uh, in the treaty by the diplomatic conference. The, um, experts, um, there were in the workshop, there were about uh, 65 experts from um, involved governments uh, from the INC uh, process discussed this, co this concept uh, informally. Um, certainly, the importance of this topic was uh, recognized and underlined. Many supported the concept um, that was a basis uh, for the discussion and underlined. Uh, the importance of having a me mechanism to update the instrument over time. So it's a recognition that there need to be uh, provisions um, in, in the treaty with regards to problematic avoided plastic products um, and um, uh, a link to, to an annex, the same for chemicals of concern and the same for information and then making sure that language in these provisions ensures that these um, uh, compilations or lists can be updated over time. Uh, there was a good discussion about the lists and criteria and information requirements. It was recognized that the draft uh, instruments needs to have provisions to cover 
problematic and viable plastic products and categories of concern, and also um, uh, many underlined the importance of having global lists for the treaty to be effective, and uh, also that there can be, um, as I said, initial lists, in particular for problematic and avoidable plastic products. It was recognized that the remaining INC time is short and some of the elements can be worked on between the diplomatic conference and the first COP. Um, we are therefore adapting uh, the concept to take into account uh, pertinent parts of this expert discussion. And we are in touch with some of the active actors to discuss um, the concept that and, and how uh, the revised content and how it can be brought into INC4, uh, as it is very important that at INC4 this topic um, receives uh, attention and negotiation time, and that also the intercessional time between INC4 and INC5 can be used uh, efficiently to further discuss on expert level this important um, topic. And so with that, I hope um, I was able to, to give an update on the intercessional work that um, happened informally and that is uh, actually ongoing. And uh, we hope to, to make that an important part of, of INC4. And you see the contact information in case you would like to get in touch uh, with us or need more information. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to uh, give this update uh, here today. Of course, I'm very happy to answer any questions that uh, colleagues may have. Back to you, Riffins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle. And finally, our last speaker will be will be Vito uh, Bunsante, IPEN Policy Advisor for Plastic. will provide IPEN views in relation to chemicals in the treaty and recommendations for the, uh, for the delegates. And I noticed in the Q&A chat, there was a question related to how plastics are covered in the in the draft, zero draft. And I think uh, your presentation, Vito, will have uh, to answer that question. Because, uh, there was also an answer from Therese. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Griffins. So um, I guess we have heard a lot of uh, uh, great speakers that gave us uh, enough of, uh, of context. So I will uh, try to be as uh, as brief as possible and uh, and reinforce some of uh, some uh, few message from our side uh, for the for the delegates. Um, I'll try. Okay. So one thing that I wanted to underline first is <clears throat> the fact that although uh, a lot of time has been uh, uh, has has passed in, during this, these negotiations, there are a few things on which uh, uh, negotiators have uh, some broad agreement, and one of them is the objective of the treaty. Uh, particularly, I want to highlight the fact that. Uh, um in both the options for objective in the in the revised zero draft uh the the protection of human health is uh, not uh, uh, disputed so the that the fact that this treaty should protect uh, uh human health and uh, uh therefore um we need to uh, consider or delegates need to consider how does the treaty address specifically uh, human health in the treaty. And uh, uh, from IPEN's point of view, as we heard uh, from uh, uh, various uh, presenter, particularly from uh, Endocrine Society, from Professor Gore, uh, chemicals are uh, a big, chemicals in plastics are a big threat to uh, uh, human health. And so regulating these chemicals is really a way for fulfilling the health objectives of the treaty. So how are uh, chemicals covered in the zero draft? Uh, I won't go into in a, in a great amount of details, but uh, uh, essentially the, the zero draft uh, or the revised zero draft attempts to cover the full life cycle of chemicals. 
Uh, and so that is is uh, is an important part to consider. It goes from uh, listing chemicals of, of concern to the design of uh, uh, of plastic products, uh, um, uh, which are made uh, of chemicals, to uh, issues related to uh, emissions of and releases of chemicals throughout the life cycle. So not only in the product. Um, so. What is uh, uh, a summary of, let, let's say, IPEN views that uh, uh, we will uh, um, communicate to uh, to delegates in uh, in our uh, in our quick views that are uh, have just been uh, published or being in the course of being published. First of all, uh, and here I'm reinforcing some of the message of uh, some of the, the speakers already. The fact that these controls on chemicals need to be global and legally binding. Uh, if we have different lists for each country, we won't uh, tackle the problem of uh, the health impacts of, of chemicals in plastic because plastics are traded uh, internationally and even when they leach into the environment, those, those chemicals just travel everywhere and they cannot be controlled so country by country. Uh, the importance of uh, addressing groups of chemicals, uh, as, uh, uh, as Kay has uh, uh, highlighted, if we don't address group of chemicals, there's a high risk of uh, uh, substitution of a chemical with another that is similar and has a similar concern for health and the environment. Uh, uh, another thing is that we need to uh, address both the use uh, uh, and the presence. So the presence of the chemical uh, in the product is not enough but because many chemicals uh, uh, are are used within uh, uh, the life cycle and are emitted in the life cycle, and, and this requires uh, a bit further uh, consideration. And uh, and again, uh, highlighting what uh, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Teres has said that. Uh, the chemical controls should not be limited only to additives. We have many kinds of uh, of chemicals, the monomers that are that form the backbones of the uh, of the uh, of the plastics, the polymers themselves, which are chemicals themselves, processing agents, uh, additives, etc. And that we we need, as we heard also from the proposal uh, that was illustrated by by Switzerland, that we need an annex that needs to be. Uh, that needs to be updated continuously. <clears throat> so, um, one thing also to underline, uh, when we talk about uh, chemicals uh, and when we talk about plastic, many uh, still think about the, the visible pollution, uh, the litter. And uh, so restricting products is an important uh, uh, aspect in uh, decreasing that uh, um, that type of uh, pollution, but we also need to uh, address that invisible um, pollution from uh, from plastic that is represented uh, by by the chemicals. Invisible only uh, because the chemicals are often not visible in the product themselves, but the impacts of uh, uh, of these chemicals is quite visible in our in our health outcomes. Um, so uh, just like uh, uh, reacting to uh, many things that we have heard from uh, uh, from delegates in general, and also uh, thinking about the proposal that was just uh, uh, illustrated by, by Switzerland is the fact that uh, it is important both to uh, tackle products uh, that are uh, of concern, but also chemicals are concerned. It's not one or the other. Uh, the products, uh, they, they look at, they have, if we were to uh, regulate only uh, products, uh, we would have a bit of a narrower approach because it's uh, products are a bit more downstream. They, they would tackle the litter and uh, especially the responsibility would go mainly to consumer good companies uh, to make them accountable. Uh, whereas for chemicals, uh, uh, regulating chemicals in the treaty really uh, would tackle the entire life cycle uh, of uh, of plastics because as plastics are made are made of uh, of uh, chemicals that um, uh, we we would look at uh, uh, those impacts throughout the life cycle and they would uh, uh, specifically have an impact on uh, positive impact on health protection and especially 
we would tackle those that are really responsible for the plastic crisis, which is the plastic industry, the chemical, uh, the, the, the industry that makes uh, these plastics, that makes these chemicals. And we would go really further up in uh, uh, up, upstream in uh, uh, tackling the, respons the, the responsibilities. So uh, finally, what are the outcomes that we're looking for? We're looking for scientific criteria for defining chemicals of concern. It's not enough to have a list of chemicals because like science uh, uh, evolves, the use of chemicals may evolve and we need to have a list that we can continuously update. But having an initial list would be uh, uh, extremely crucial. There are There is a lot of evidence about chemicals of concern and we can already act on those chemicals. As we heard by uh, Kay earlier, even in the Stockholm Convention, it can take four years for a chemical to be addressed and then further uh, uh, many more years than uh, to be implemented. So we know uh, certain chemicals are more of, uh, are of concern and, and those concerns are known. And so such chemicals as phthalates, bisphenols, uh, they can already be, uh, be, uh, be listed. And we need to obviously take into consideration mechanisms for exemptions. This or, or these already exist under the Stockholm Conventions, but we need to make sure that they're time bound and subject to reviews. And we should keep the door open in the treaty for the regulation of polymers that have risk profiles that make them um, uh, harmful to human health and the environment. Finally, uh, it is important, uh, transparency is an important aspect. Uh, we often talk about recycling, we talk about waste being uh, uh, moved from a country to another for products being used, but we often or, or very rarely know what these plastics are made. This is an important for the accountability of the plastic industry or for the maker, makers of this product, uh, these products and these products uh, travel internationally, so it is important that this treaty makes sure that there are mechanisms for transparency and traceability. And with that, I thank you all. And back to you, Griffiths. Dito, I think you, think you need to take it over because Griffins might have um, connection problems in. Uh... Oh, okay. Okay, here. Okay, here you are, Griffins. I'll leave it up to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think I, my internet dropped there. That it's a good time for questions and answer. I think. Thank you very much, Vito, for that. So we have eighteen eight more minutes remaining. Uh, we want to maybe just uh, go through the questions that are. Yeah, and if there is anyone who has a burning question, maybe you can raise the hand to the panelists. So if I may just pose one that uh, or two questions that are observed in the chat. Uh, so one question to all panelists, if certain chemicals are bad, should they be, should their use be banned or restricted in all applications? Why just plastics? And there was a question, the avenues for youth engagement when it comes to plastics and the health now and beyond. So on the first It seems that Griffins is having some connection problems, so I will jump in here and just touch upon the the importance of addressing chemicals in other contexts as well. Um, the reason that we're talking about plastic chemicals here specifically is because of the ongoing negotiations on a plastics treaty, which really does present an excellent opportunity to address toxic chemicals in plastics, because in plastics, there are so many chemicals that are used with very little control and very little transparency. And, but that doesn't mean it's not important to address toxic chemicals in a lot of other contexts as well. And 
uh, as Kay was talking about, there's under the Stockholm Convention, there's also mechanisms for addressing chemicals in other contexts. For example, many of the chemicals that are listed there are pesticides. But the reason we chose to focus specifically on plastics here is because of the ongoing plastics negotiations. I don't know if any one of my other fellow speakers would want to jump in here. I would like to jump in. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for that, Therese. Uh, and I think here to, to respond to this question, here the limit that we have is our mandate because a uh, union resolution 5 slash 14 gave us a mandate to address plastic pollution. So that's why we are uh, limiting this discussion uh, to the chemicals that are related to plastics and that are used throughout the life cycle of plastics. Uh, for me, it's also, if, if we can go um, even further, we can also discuss about the chemicals that are used in the production and that they are not then part of the product. <laughs> but then, uh, yes, I think I, I totally I totally agree with Therese that here we have a, a very valuable opportunity of addressing uh, all these issues because we are we are negotiating a very complex issue. We are facing an urgent crisis that we really need to address. And also, I think that well, we heard Kay uh, also regarding the BRS conventions. We also share the view that those conventions can be strengthened and can they they have a lot of potential to continue being developed. But here, under the INC negotiations, we have the unique opportunity to address specifically this issue, and we need to use this opportunity appropriately. And we really need we must to address all these hazardous chemicals and and avoidable and problematic products and also the, the polymers of concern. Thank you very much. If I can add also uh, from my side, um, the, 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 we might see as like this, what about this chemical, what about that chemical and so on and so forth. But what really need here is system change. So if there is at least a chemical that there is a need to control chemicals in plastics, then the, the government will need to put in place the mechanism to identify, ensure traceability of a chemical. You don't really do it just for one chemical. You put in place the mechanism so that you will ensure that other chemicals also used in plastics be able to ident be identified, traced, and ensure that it doesn't go to recycling stream. So it, it, it might be that you start off with small number of chemicals, but because it will require change in regulatory system or approach to, to labeling issue and uh, mechanism so that you don't only um, address chemicals in plastics. You can, it could also mean that that mechanism once it put in place, in order to be able to trace certain chemicals in products, it could be easily applied to other materials like paper or um, glass or whatever others. So, so therefore, um, the as Therese mentioned, that this it is an opportunity to strengthen the sound management of chemicals and waste as a whole. Um, of course, the mandate indeed is the plastic pollution and the plastic products. And here you have the good um, reason for looking at those toxic chemicals that you, you might be impacted. Um, but from the regulatory standpoint, um, it has lots of potential, including positive impact on the Stockholm Convention. As I mentioned, for the POPs also, um, identification uh, of POPs in products and articles is remaining very challenging. So if this um, uh, effort is joined, then it will have um, also strengthened implementation of the existing MEAs. Thank you so much uh, for reflecting on that question. Just two more minutes to go before we call it um, off because we just had 90 minutes for this. Uh, is there anybody who can maybe reflect on the avenues for youth engagement when it comes to plastics, uh, uh, plastic uh, and health now and beyond? And then I also was not able to see whether there was a hand uh, maybe raised. Uh, maybe if there was any, I can be informed on that. But just over to you panelists for one minute.
I'm I'm happy to take that uh, that very quickly. I think one of the the issues that in general we need to look at in the treaty is like really the the uh, recently the there there has been a um, a resolution of the UN General Assembly on uh, uh, on the right to a healthy environment, and one of those uh, uh, one of the um, mechanisms for uh, implementing the right to a healthy environment is really access to information, public participation, uh, and access to justice. So when it comes to chemicals, the, the, the best way to engage the youth is, first of all, uh, implementing those transparency uh, mechanisms to to let them know what they are exposed to, because otherwise, and then the second, make them really a part of the implementation of a treaty. So here we, we would go mainly in implementation measures like participation in making a national implementation plan, uh, assess what are the impacts on the on on uh, a young generation of these chemicals, as Professor Gore said. Uh, she said some a great quote, which is the timing that makes the poison and the, the timing is really uh, affecting uh, uh, future generations. Thank you. Thank you. So as we just maybe wrap up and also give opportunity to maybe Michelle and or Professor Gore uh, for also final reflection in this session. There was a question also that was asked about the balance of plastic in healthcare and benefits for what it brings to the healthcare. So maybe as your final maybe reflections as, as we close. Thank you. Michelle, maybe. Oh, Professor Gore, are you ready? Uh, I don't know whether. I think you know. Michelle may be muted. Yeah, yeah. Still on mute. Okay. Well, I can take a stab at that. Um, in at least as far as phthalates are concerned, they're very widely used in the medical community as IV tubing. Um, they're even fillers in in prescription medicines. And I think there's a. I think the solution is we have to be much more creative in finding other um, types of materials for things like IV tubing. We can't just keep substituting one phthalate for another. So I know there are, um, you know, scientists in both the private sector and government trying to develop new uh, materials to make. Uh, tubing that does not contain endocrine disruptors, for example. Um, an important part of that is proper testing because the way these materials are often tested is not in a way that will necessarily reveal endocrine disruption. So it requires expertise there. Um, but we just can't keep substituting these one chemicals for another. Thank you. I don't know whether Michelle you are able to sort the. Yes, just I hope you can closing. hear me now. Yes, yes, great. Okay, great. Thanks for um, giving me the floor again. Um, I think from an institutional point of view, it's also very important to speak about the interlinkages of uh, environment and, and health. We, um, I think it's very important that um, we use existing expertise and existing uh, institutions to the best. Uh, in order to um, address this complex matter. Um, it is therefore very important that we use the synergies with the BRS conventions, um, with the Minamata convention, with uh, other um, uh, chemicals and waste processes. Um, it's also very important that we use the expertise of the World Health uh, Organization. Um, of course, from, from the Swiss perspective, uh, it makes in, in that context sense to mention Geneva as an important um, cluster of um, environmental and health uh, governance and that it in, uh, in this, in this uh, nexus is very important to bring these actors uh, together, uh, have them work jointly and ensure then also with um, the provisions that we will have in our instrument um, we ensure that um, we use that expertise, that we ensure mutual uh, supportiveness and synergies and, and not hierarchies between existing instruments. We already have very good examples for that 
uh, within uh, existing, you know, decisions of uh, BRS and Minamata and so on, where the parties chose to specify um, that this collaboration is important and that, that it can be done in a way that fully respects the legal autonomy also of existing instruments. So there is a lot um, uh, to draw on in terms of um, uh, provisions and institutional um, approaches on how this can be done in a, in a very effective way. And I'm convinced that this is a very uh, important aspect uh, to, to ensure the, the, the future plastic treaty will indeed you know, help us to reach the objectives and really protect uh, human health. Um, both human health and the environment um, from plastic pollution and indeed uh, from pollution that very often time or the, the biggest part actually is not visible like uh, Vito you have you've rightly so pointed out and this is uh, therefore also sometimes a difficult part to, to address and to uh, discuss with, um, with the many actors involved and we think uh, with a joint effort we can really uh, make uh, important progress in, in that sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So we've come to the end of this webinar. I want to thank you all for taking time and for your indulgence for uh, going past by five minutes. Uh, we appreciate all your time and uh, for very insightful discussions. Uh, until next time, maybe a pass over to Diana just in case of any announcement. There were a lot of uh, you know requests uh, on the chat as well. But uh, from my side, I also appreciate uh, for you. Thank you very much. And have a very good rest of the day. Thank you very much, uh, Griffin. Thank you. And thank you to all the colleagues, uh, panelists, and attendees who join us and those who will watch this video later. Just to remind you that there are a few more sessions coming up after the Easter break. We will be discussing uh, trade related issues in preparation of INC4. We will be also having other discussions linking to human rights and to other topics that are not on this slide. So, um, uh, keep looking at, at these pages and at this space. Uh, and we wish all of you who won't be joining us in the next sessions a fruitful preparation uh, for discussions uh, and, and a good outcome of uh, the INC4 session. Thank you all.